Two little boys were talking after junior church one day. And uh, one of them said to the other, Do you believe that there really is a devil, like they said? And the other one said, No, he said, I don't think so. I think it's like Santa Claus. It's probably really your dad. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the Bible teaches that... Uh, yeah. Sorry, Carl. The Bible teaches that the devil is real. Uh, no joke. I don't. Uh, I don't talk a lot about the devil. If you if you are a regular attender here, you know that I don't talk a lot about him. But I don't ignore him either. C.S. Lewis said that uh, we tend to go to one of two extremes. Some churches see Satan behind everything. You know, behind every sickness, behind every sin. They give the devil too much credit. That is one extreme. However. The other extreme is far more common. Many Christians don't recognize Satan or his work at all. When things go wrong, as they often do in our broken world, they blame their parents, or they blame their wives, or they blame their kids, or their teachers. Sometimes they blame the government. They may blame themselves, and they often blame God, but they seldom blame the devil. You know, Ephesians 6, verse 12 tells us, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There is a war going on. A spiritual battle between good and evil, between God and Satan. The Bible says, resist him, resist Satan. That's in verse 9 of 1 Peter chapter 5. Resist the devil. Each of us as Jesus followers and all of us as the church of Jesus Christ need to do our part in the struggle against the spiritual forces of evil. Now in order to overcome the devil and to be victorious in the spiritual war we are in, we must be alert, according to verse 8. We need an awareness of the enemy. Now before I go further, I want to acknowledge the teaching of Greg Boyd on spiritual warfare, from whose material I have borrowed freely in the preparation of this message. Greg Boyd was the speaker at the Theological Day, sponsored by the Via Christ Church of Canada, and I had the opportunity to be there along with Dave and Carol and to hear him in person. What can we learn about the devil from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9? Well, quite a lot, actually. First, he is the enemy of the church. The word your in this verse is plural. He is your enemy. He not only hates you personally, he opposes the work of God in every local church. I want to tell you, the devil hates Delisle Community Chapel because we are seeking to know and to do God's will. He hates the fact that we are here loving God, loving people, and making disciples. He seeks to bring division or persecution or anything else that will hinder the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments. By that we mean baptism and holy communion. He will seek to attack from inside as well as from outside the church. What else do we learn about the devil? We learn that he is a dangerous adversary. Peter calls him a lion. Some years ago, my wife and I had the opportunity to visit South Wangwa National Park in Zambia, and we saw a pair of lions close up. I want to tell you, when you see mature lions right up close in the wild, they are a very impressive sight. They were actually resting, just laying there together, a male and a female. We were like 10 yards away in our 4x4. Four four. As long as you stay in the vehicle, they totally ignore you. You get out, you become part of the food chain. <laughs> Lions, obviously, are dangerous. How would you react if there was a lion prowling through your neighborhood? How would you react if there was a lion inside your home? Satan is dangerous, and he needs to be taken seriously. We also learn that he is an accuser or a slanderer. He accuses us to God. 
The Bible tells us the story of Job and how Satan appears before God and, and he's got nothing good to say about Job. He says, the only reason he worships you is because you bless him so good. He is all over Christians to God, accusing us. And not only that, but he accuses God to us. Remember what he said to Eve in the Garden of Eden? Has God really said you should not eat of it? Did he say that you would die if you ate that fruit? He just doesn't want you to be like him. He knows that if you eat it, you'll become wise like he is, knowing the difference between good and evil. He is an accuser. He accuses us to God. He accuses God to us. But Romans 8, 1 tells us there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Satan often uses stealth to catch believers. The Bible says he prowls around. He's sneaky. To prowl means to roam stealthily in search of prey or plunder. We have an enemy who stealthily, like any successful hunter, tries to sneak up on his prey. He doesn't show up in a red suit saying, hey, I want to kill you. The Bible says that Satan masquerades as an angel of light, according to 2 Corinthians 11, 14. He may sneak into your home through the things that you watch on TV or on the internet, things you read, or through certain relationships. Even sometimes through people presenting themselves as ministers of the faith. Jesus called people like that wolves in sheep's clothing in Matthew 7, 15. And the devil often uses fear tactics. Peter says he is a roaring lion. Did you know that lions paralyze their prey by roaring? The lion roars and the antelope freezes. And it's easy to catch it. Satan uses worry, anxiety, and fear to keep people from growing in faith and doing God's will. They're afraid to be baptized. Afraid to take communion. Afraid to witness. Afraid to lead junior church. He uses fear to keep us from being what God wants us to be. And Satan's end goal is to destroy human lives. The Bible says that he is looking for someone to devour. Jesus said of him, he was a murderer from the beginning. John 8 and 44. The Bible says, hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 2. And then we need to recognize that Satan's attack is worldwide. The Bible says, the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Scripture calls Satan the god of this age and the prince of this world. God with a small g. He has created a system that works against God and those who follow God. So don't be surprised when you are mocked for your values and your beliefs. Don't be shocked when you are discriminated against in the workplace because you stand for what is right. Centuries ago, the Emperor Nero burned Christians at the stake to provide light for his gardens in ancient Rome. In our time, we see ISIS terrorists targeting Christians in very cruel and inhumane ways. Those are extreme examples. But it's the same spirit that stands against Christ in every situation. Satan will tell you that you're the only one having a hard time because you're a Christian. That's a lie. Peter, writing under divine inspiration, assures us that the family of God throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Look around you at the people in church this morning. Go ahead, it's all right. Take a look at these folks around you. I want to tell you something. If you think that you are the only person here this morning experiencing problems and suffering, you are being fooled by the enemy. So, how do you as a believer, how do we as a church family resist the devil? Well, the Bible says, be alert 
and have a sober mind. Do not allow anything to control your mind other than the Spirit of God Himself. Some people are so focused on accumulating material things that they completely forget about spiritual things, which are so much more important. Jesus warned that those who store up treasures on earth instead of preparing for their inheritance in heaven are on the wrong track. You've seen the bumper sticker. He who dies with the most toys wins. Now, he who dies with the most toys dies. Just like everybody else. When you die, you'll leave it all behind. I heard about uh, a fellow who was making good time up the highway, passing a lot of cars. They seemed to be moving slowly, and all of a sudden, he came up behind a hearse. And he realized that he'd been passing a funeral procession. He was kind of embarrassed, especially since he was driving a Brinks armored truck. So he just pulled in behind the hearse and went along at the same speed as the rest of the procession, and the car coming the other way. The wife looked over to her husband, and she said, Look, honey, there is somebody who's taking it with them. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way, does it? You can't take it with you. When you die, you'll leave it all behind. Being sober means having a right attitude about spiritual things versus material things. But it also includes being free of things that control your mind. Addictions to alcohol, cigarettes, drugs. The person who is addicted to drugs is depending on the drug rather than on God. You know, in the Bible, as in our time, the use of drugs is often linked to pagan worship and witchcraft. You don't believe that that still happens today? Well, here's a sad statistic. 75% of all sexual assaults at the time of the assault, either the offender or the victim or both, are under the influence of alcohol. To be sober means to be self-controlled. In fact, some translations translate it as self-control. We need to be self-controlled. 1 Corinthians 9.25 says, Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So we need to be conscious, as we've been reminded in our prayer time today, of how we eat, the things we eat, the things we drink, sleep, exercise, and the use of media. Sometimes Satan wins the battle in church the night before. The student can't concentrate on worship because he was up all night hanging out with friends. And then we resist the devil by standing firm in the faith. How? By putting your entire trust in God himself. You stand firm in faith by knowing and using scripture. You know, when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, he answered every one of Satan's temptations by a quotation from Scripture. We stand firm in the faith by living a holy life, by putting on the armor of God as described in Ephesians chapter 6. And we stand firm in the faith by prayer. Jesus said, watch and pray so that you do not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I read something that's kind of cute along the lines of that verse. Uh, somebody was using an early computerized uh, translation on the computer. They wanted to translate from English into Russian. And uh, so the idea was to translate the verse, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And the computer did its best job and it, it translated it this way. The vodka is okay, but the meat is rotten. <laughs> That's not what's being talked about here. Okay? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. And then we stand firm in the faith by a life of worship. When we praise God, the devil flees. He can't stand to be around to hear praise to Jesus. And so I ask you, are you worshipful or do you worry and complain? 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxieties on Him, for He cares for you. When you complain, you are saying, Really? 
God, you don't care. When you worry, you're telling God, I don't think you can handle this. It is essential that we gather regularly to worship God as a church, to praise Him, to hear His Word, to participate in the sacrament of Holy Communion. And then we stand firm in the faith by living in fellowship, in right relationship with the church family. The Christian who separates himself from the body will come under great attack. Last night, some of us gathered around a campfire. And uh, it was just a small fire. We, we didn't need a big fire to roast marshmallows, and the evening was warm. But uh, at some point, uh, one of the men there decided that the fire was bigger than what we really needed. And uh, so he, he reached in and he, he took you know, one, of the, one of the pieces of wood and removed it from the fire pit, set it to the side. You know what happened to that? That piece quit burning very quickly. And the same thing happens to Christians who separate themselves from worship with the body. The flame of enthusiasm for Christ soon dies out. Dissension and unforgiveness open the door for Satan to mess with you. Don't let it happen. Finally, we resist the devil by persevering during times of trial. Never give up hope. I'll tell you something. I read the end of the book. We win. <laughs> Revelation 22, 12. This is the very last chapter in the Bible. Jesus says, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. So, in summary, we resist the devil by recognizing him and his tactics, by being sober and self-controlled, by standing firm in our faith, and by persevering in times of trial, knowing that God's grace will triumph at last. This morning, I encourage you to allow the grace of our God to flow over, around, and within you as we come together to the table of our Lord. We pray. Our loving Father God, thank you so much, so much, that you have provided with everything that we need to resist the death and to live lives of victory. As we come to the table of our Lord, we want to thank you for the broken body, the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us on that cross. Thank you that the debt was paid in full, and we may go free. Help us as we share today the bread and the wine to be conscious that your spirit is bringing your grace to us. We thank you 